Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to my little section here on improvising through lockdown. Um, this is uh, a, a series of thoughts and kind of uh, based on my book uh, of how improvisation can kind of help us, particularly from an agile point of view, but obviously with the, uh, the current um, uh, mode that we're living in, how I've been using improvisation in my coaching and in my uh, in this lockdown time. So uh, I'm going to use this time to um, walk you through five sections, uh, five principles of, ad, uh, of improvisational theory and improvisational principles with the hope that I can see you, help you see some of the links between improvisation and agile development. So uh, my name is Paul. Um, some of you might know me or have seen me around the, uh, the agile circuit. I've been a certified scrum trainer uh, since around 2006. I'm also a certified enterprise coach with the Scrum Alliance and I'm also a part of the CSP educator. So I offer a lot of different training courses, particularly from the Scrum Alliance um, around the UK. I've been fairly active in the UK uh, Agile community um, since kind of early 2000s. Um, improvisation. So I, I first got interested in improvis improvisation probably when I was a kid and I used to watch Whose Lines It Anyway on the television on Channel 4 back in the day. Um, and uh, I, I looked at that uh, kind of in more recent times and I went on a, an improv workshop in about 2012 and I started to see a lot of these similarities between improvisation and what I did for a living, which is uh, agile development. So I thought there's some interesting parallels here and I, I just decided to write about it. So in this uh, brief little overview here, uh, I'm going to share with you a few of these different things. Now, just a few kind of ground rules, if you like, on um, on improvisation and something that I tell my clients and my my uh, attendees in my courses when I'm teaching them some improv is that it's not about being any of these three things. You'll see improvisation on the television. If you've seen Who's Lies Anyway, it's associated with comedy. It's associated with make, making people laugh and it's associated with making things up on the spot. And it looks like quite a chaotic environment, but obviously um, a lot of people don't really understand is the history of improvisation comes from uh, the 1930s in, in the USA when uh, a lady called Viola Spoling was trying to teach young uh, immigrant children how to, to learn English as a, as a second language. And she developed a lot of these games as storytelling techniques and game role playing games for children to learn English. So a lot of the history, a lot of the background doesn't even come from comedy at all. Um, some of the, uh, one of the other inspirations for me, particularly in my, uh, when writing my book was both Viola Spolin there on the left and Keith Johnston. And Keith Johnston um, was a, a big influence on me. Uh, he was very much an improvisation a teacher who's taught students, drama students, how to deal with uncertainty on stage, particularly in the dramatic arts and the royal court. So not really anything to do with comedy at all. And Keith, a lot of the games that Keith has written about are great games just to help people deal with uncertainty. And I've taken a lot of those thoughts on board uh, in, in my work uh, on improvisation. So I thought in this little uh, half hour I've got with you here, I'd just share with you something from each of the five elements of my book. So five chapters, uh, we've got safety, we've got spontaneity, uh, storytelling, status and sensitivity. So I thought I'd just give you a brief look into each of those five principles and how I apply them as an agile coach. Safety, first of all. So um, one of the big principles around improvisational theatre and improvisational principles is the idea that um, mistakes and failure uh, is actually a positive thing, can actually be something which can allow progress to resume and, and access to work off each other's mistakes. And in fact, we, they, by making so many mistakes on stage, improvisational actors tend to form these really close um, working troops, an improvisation troupe as a group of people, it's usually two, three, four, five, six people on stage, but they're working very tightly together. And if they make a mistake, they kind of just have to roll with it. There's no particular way to go back and, and, and reverse and, and do the scene again. 
and someone makes a mistake, they just kind of go with it. And that reminded me very much of, of how certainly within uh, the agile space, we tend to think that uh, mistakes are costly and mistakes are, going, are inefficient. But in fact, so the uh, looking at the Kinevin model here, which some of you might have seen before from Cognitive Edge, a lot of that agile product development work tends to happen in that complex space, that area where we don't really know what the right answer is yet. In fact, there could be several right answers. So making mistakes is actually quite a, a useful thing to us. And that sometimes fights with our inner inefficiency. We want to get the, the best result as quick as we can. But if we're working in a complex way, mistakes can actually help us. Experiments can actually help us. And in order to do that, we need to be comfortable with the idea of experiments not working or mistakes actually happening. So a lot of improv games are actually designed with failure built in. They actually encourage failure. They actually allow for mistakes to happen in order to get other players back into the game much quicker and let progress move on. So making failure acceptable is one thing. Another thing I'd just like to um, uh, talk about is one of my favourite books and one of the big influences for me when I was writing my book was Patrick Lencioni's work around the five dysfunctions of a team. Again, another book or reference here that you might have seen before. Lencioni's work very much describes the fundamental flaw in team development is this absence of trust. Uh, basically, people wanting to appear invulnerable. They are perfect. They have no flaws. Now, in order to do that, in order to break through that, uh, that absence of trust, we have to flip that round and be happy to be vulnerable. We have to be happy to share our weaknesses and admit our mistakes. So with the benefit of, of an improv approach here is by playing games and, and organising and allowing for mistakes to happen and, and actually enjoying some of the mistakes we make can allow for some of that more vulnerable uh, element to, to occur within a, a scrum team and hopefully build some trust on the back of it. So that's a little bit around safety. We'll move on and we'll have a little bit of a look at something called spontaneity. So again, there's lots of uh, agile games you can play around spontaneity, but the idea, we tend to feel that the word spontaneous, when we're, particularly when we're kids, tends to be a word that gets us into trouble. It tends to have negative connotations. And certainly some of the uh, early stories I can imagine with my young kids, acts of spontaneity generally involved in me getting too very frustrated and exhausted with trying to clean up after my children. But in fact, spontaneity tends to be, can be, where a lot of creativity can be found. And it's again making sponta spontaneous behaviour, increasing the flow of ideas, more of a safe environment to work in. We've got here listening with intent. So this is kind of the, the main, the key mantra that improvisation uh, teams or troops live by. Improvisers on stage work on the principle of yes and. This is basically whenever something is presented to them on stage by their partner or their, their fellow team members, they accept it and they go with it. Even if it's something they don't really think is a great idea or a great um, offer. Yes, and you can see some of the examples there of what that might look like. These kind of uh, approaches are generally trying to say yes will tend to promote more positive, spontaneous response. On the flip side, our problem solving brains tend to prefer to work, particularly in a problem solving environment like, in, like an agile space. We tend to like to think about something like yes, but. Yes, but there might be several reasons why something won't work. Yes, but we don't do things like this this way. Yes, but we've come across this before and these things happened. As soon as we add a word, the word but, we almost eliminate the positivity of the word yes, because we're presenting a problem. And if we want to try and increase the flow of ideas, increase the creativity of teams, taking a more positive approach 
will, instead of adding a barrier to progress, can actually add some kind of benefit or additional uh, um, th thoughts or ideas that we hadn't perhaps heard of yet. So yes and is the basic kind of ethos of an improviser on stage. We accept an idea and then we add to it. And if we're all doing that on stage, we might find we're able to get a lot of ideas flowing in a fairly quick process. There's some nice uh, vocabulary that, that uh, improvisers use and I've started to use when I'm coaching, which is the, the, the notion of offers and blocks. So it's basically yes, a, a yes and approach here, but they're actually putting names around the types of the units of currency that the improvisers use on stage. The first one is the offer. And an offer is just, it can be a, a verbal or visual cue for something to happen, for some kind of idea to be moved forward, some positive progress. I was gonna try and uh, describe this to you now via, via camera, and it's very odd doing this. Improvising on your own is not really how it was intended to be, uh, to be done, but I'm gonna have a go. And to aid me with this, I always carry um, a big bag of hats. You can't see it right now, but people, people laugh at me when I'm, when I'm carrying these around to workshops. But I always have a, a number of hats available to me for, for, for moments like this. So I will describe to you from in, improvisational terms what an offer is. So if you imagine you're an improviser is on stage with a, with a fellow, a partner or an improviser with them, they might call out to the audience for some kind of uh, location to set their scene. And let's just say for argument's sake, they call out the word hospital. Okay, so we're going to set our, our scene in a hospital. So the first, this might be the first offer that you see on the stage. Good morning, doctor. So that's an offer. Good morning, doctor. It's firstly, the yes and, is, as you'll see going through this, the yes and is accepting the offer that the um, audience has made. The, audi the audience's offer was uh, hospital and the uh, improviser's reaction was, I'm going to accept hospital by saying, yes, I'm going to propose here that we're using a doctor. You're going to be the doctor in the scene and we're going to establish the and here is the time of day, which is good morning, which is a great first offer. So let's play that back and then I'll play the role of the other improviser on stage. For instance, good morning, doctor. Good morning, nurse. So the same type of thing. We've got two actors now. The yes and was I accept good morning by repeating it back to you. I'm going to agree with you that it's morning and then I'm going to label you in this case a nurse. We're going to be a doctor and nurse in this hospital scene. The same type of then the story can kind of emerge. Um, the other um, word that I'd like to just describe, which you might be able to think about where these types of offers uh, occur in, in your environment, is the opposite of that, which is a block. So a block, I'll just describe that to you. Same type of scene, hospital scene. Good morning, doctor. I'm not a doctor. That's an example of a block. This was a great uh, example of, of, of offers and blocks that I saw from Neil Malarkey, who um, did a TED talk a while back, and he was, he was a huge influence for me to write my book. But a block will generally get a laugh from the audience. It might be something that the audience didn't expect, but you can kind of see the pressure that that puts on the other improviser on stage because their idea of good morning doctor hasn't been accepted. Now, genuinely great improvisers are able to turn blocks back into offers. So you can imagine that kind of scene. I'm not a doctor, but then that improviser might say, I'm not a, I'm not a nurse. I just kind of walk around this hospital pretending that I'm, I'm uh, treating people. That's the type of example of, of turning a block into a great offer. So thank you very much to Neil Malarkey for introducing me to that uh, little example there. As agile coaches, we're trying to increase our offer, the offers in our environment. We're trying to look for opportunities, not just to add offers ourselves, but to allow, enable others 
to create offers of their own. And see if you can listen out in the environment that you work into, into where blocks are occurring. They're just shutting down progress. They're stifling spontaneity. Good stuff. OK, so moving on to storytelling. So this is um, a picture you may not have seen before. This is called Freitag's Pyramid. This is um, a theory based on a, a 19th century German playwright called Gustav Freitag, in which he describes the seven kind of elements or phases that screenwriters can follow to allow them to create sympathy for a character on, on stage or in a film or in a book, that kind of thing. Where there's a central character, this is what is called the Freitag's Pyramid, sometimes also known as the dramatic arc, which is probably the more common name for it. Now, this was interesting because improvisers use these dramatic arts all the time. Actors use them. Ho Hollywood filmmakers use these pretty much exclusively all the time. So this is a great way that we can create connection between an audience and a story. And I kind of believe that agile coaches and agile practitioners can really benefit from trying to include more of this story structure into their work. For example, if you're doing Scrum, a sprint should really be able to follow this dramatic arc. The three acts in this particular sprint might be the exposition, which is the planning session, we're setting a scene. We've got some kind of climax, which might be the middle of the sprint or where the most of the work is being done. And then we've got resolution in the, the sprint review session or the retrospective. We can kind of follow that natural arc in how we work. So trying to um, encourage teams to take on more storytelling techniques and structures can actually be of benefit to not just motivate and galvanize teams together, but also to increase um, the level of empowerment and the level of engagement that customers and development teams can have with each other. One other example I've got here of how I've used story structures in scrum teams and coaching scrum teams is by a game from a, a, an improv teacher called Ken Adams. And he talks about something called the story spine, which is actually a technique that Pixar studios have, have used extensively as well. Ken Adams talks about this eight part structure of breaking down a simple story into a dramatic arc using the starts of those sentences you can see on screen. A nice adaptation that I've used is taking that, that idea of a spine and manipulating it into a sprint goal, which a lot of teams can use within the Scrum framework to kind of galvanize a team before they start a sprint. Using that structure, we can kind of work with a product owner to define quite, quite um, firmly what the beginning of that story is, who the character is, what problem the, the character is experiencing, and then we focus on until one day this sprint happens. We are now, this is the point we're at now where this sprint is about to happen. And then we can start to think about what features we might design in order to help the end of the story be a happy one. So the user can finally solve this problem and ever since then, then the user can actually gain this type of benefit from our product. But leaving that middle part, the dramatic element, the climax of that story open will actually, hopefully, allow the team to add some ideas of their own into how we can actually make that happy ending occur within our, our sprint story. So a nice way to think about adding uh, storytelling into a little bit of your sprint planning process. OK, so that's kind of chapter three. Uh, and then we've got chapter four, which is status. Now, this is a big um, more advanced subject within improvisation and quite a challenging one for, for actors, but it's really about trying to change your behaviour on stage, your body language on stage, um, the tone of your voice on stage to allow offers to occur, perhaps even without saying something. I'll try and give you some examples of this because um, there's probably some more familiar ones that we, we recognise. Bearing in mind that the, the human brain is, is, is naturally tuned in to, to how to adjust and see very small changes in body language and facial expressions. We can use that to our advantage to kind of help collaboration occur. 
And what improvisers on stage have taught, certainly by Keith Johnston, is the fact that playing with status, changing your status, might allow more natural storytelling to emerge, or certainly to increase audience engagement. Let's give you an example with two characters that I'm sure you will recognise from these two photos, uh, Laurel and Hardy. Now, good examples here of what improvisers would call low and high status roles on stage. Starting with Stan Laurel there on the left, he's generally adopting in that, that photo at the top right, for, uh, sorry, the top left on my screen, a low status position in front of the camera. Generally taking, uh, making himself smaller, he is generally the smaller character. Um, looking away, not making eye, eye contact with the, um, the camera, and he's got his kind of hand to close towards his mouth. All associated with ways that actors can make themselves low status, more uh, inferior compared to high status characters. Oliver Hardy, on the other hand, tends to play more high status roles. So he is naturally a bigger person, a bigger actor. Uh, he generally holds eye contact with the camera in a lot more longer gaze and just kind of that natural look of, of, of more superior knowledge and experience around the certain situation that Laurel and Hardy might be in. Now, Laurel and Hardy are good examples here of where we get joy from watching them on, on, on the screen when the status switch occurs. So improvisers are told to encourage this, that you get natural collaboration and, 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 and storytelling emerges when, when the audience sees a shift or a switch in the status position. So in the bottom right picture there that you can see, uh, Stan Laurel has got kind of a, a small flame, I think, um, uh, from his thumb, but you can see how the status has changed just very subtly, that uh, now there's superior knowledge from Stan not Laurel and Oliver Hardy is kind of now more inferior in that in that scene. He's he's actually slightly adjusted his status to make it uh, more interesting for the audience to look at. So what our improv has taught me is how we can change our behaviour, and perhaps it could be the words that we say, particularly in in um, as a scrum master or some kind of facilitator, where you perhaps don't want to take a, a high status position in a meeting and allow more um, other members of your team to take more of a high status role instead. So as a servant leader, as a scrum master, being able to take a step back and say, how can I help you deliver this? Or how can I, is there anything I can do to, to serve you better? Is very much a low status response and a low status position to take. And we're trying just very subtly in what we do, but also trying to observe status behaviours in team members that we work with to see how that might affect the collaboration that we see in, in the team on a day-to-day -day basis. Good stuff, okay. So that's a bit of status. And kind of the final um, element of this, uh, of, of my um, five chapters in my book, which I think kind of sums it up as, as how to work, is one that I've labeled sensitivity. So sensitivity is very much just paying attention to us and the skills that we have, our natural human skills. And I did some interesting comparisons between improvisers on stage and the skills that they're using, but also the skills that we're using in agile development and agile coaching uh, on a daily basis. So I tried to combine them here into a single slide and I've described it by what improvisers call being in the moment. So this is where in the moment is, is where an improviser is completely focused on everything that's happening with their fellow actors on stage. The, even the audience is kind of superfluous at this point because they're so tuned in to what their partner or their partners are doing on stage. And I described it as four different, there are probably many more, but four main different areas that I think are skills that we can work on to help us remain more in the moment within our agile context. Listening, I'm sure you've heard of um, in terms of the, the different levels of listening that we can operate at, observational skills. So just being more aware on a daily basis about what's happening around us, taking a, a bit of time to actually be able to see. And something, something I've been doing a lot in lockdown, the things that you 
you miss on a daily basis because you're you're running very you're running too fast too many jobs on you just don't have time to look up and see what's around you recollection is a bit more of an interesting one being able to remember things being able to recall things as an improviser that's an extremely useful skill because offers don't always have to be original we could always try and reincorporate what's happened in the past and reintroduce an old offer to allow collaboration to start to occur again more naturally. And uh, finally, their emotional awareness. And this is one I think we have perhaps have to work a bit harder at. Certainly the, a lot of the, the work, the great work that's been done around emotional intelligence and just being as, as agile practitioners, more happy to share more information uh, about our own emotions will allow us to, um, to grow and learn more about how we can see and share the emotions that we have in, in other members of our team as well. So there we have it. So kind of five um, different themes there that kind of really uh, cement what an improviser does on stage. But also, hopefully, there's extreme amounts of overlap here between what agile practitioners do on a daily basis as well. And we're trying to operate in that kind of living in the moment uh, environment where there's offers all around us in order to create offers we do need a sense of safety we need to know that our offers aren't going to be rejected aren't, we're not going to feel judged by the offers that we present and if we can try and connect some of those offers into a story our storytelling capabilities will increase the levels of of energy and engagement that we get within agile teams Knowing that a small adjustments in status will affect our ability to collaborate with the other people we work with and how that might allow for collaboration, but equally actually might stifle collaboration to occur. And all the time remaining in the moment by remaining sensitive to the emotions that other people have as well as our own. So hopefully that was a, a useful uh, discussion. I say discussion, monologue. But um, I've got a bit of time. If any of you are interested uh, to take some questions, uh, please feel free to, to add those and we'll try and um, add, I'll try and answer some of those as best I can. If you um, are interested, I am running more of these um, during lockdown. I've, I've kind of been doing some online modular uh, improv sessions for people who are interested in learning a little bit more in a safe environment. So we're doing those online as well as our regular kind of Scrum Master and Scrum Product Owner courses online as well. So there's some details there on the screen if you are interested in finding out a little bit more about those. But um, I've got a bit of time for questions if anyone would like to fire away. Garrett, have you got any other questions on, on this yeah, one? Yeah, I'm just checking, check, just checking now, Paul. I can't see anything coming through at the moment. OK, cool. Just let me know. Yeah, I will, yeah. No problem. Excellent session anyway, Paul. Really enjoyed that. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, the story, storytelling part in particular for me. Yeah. That's yeah, good. really good. Yeah. What was that free tags pyramid? Yeah. It's interesting stuff when you consider a lot of, um, well, you go through most Hollywood films, they tend to follow that kind of path. And that's what keeps you in the cinema for two hours straight because you're, you're completely immersed in the character development. So why not try and introduce some of that into the characters that we work with? Characters as in users in this place, in, in a sense, to try and get a sense of you know, what's our, what story is our user going through with this product rather than just, um, you know, a name on a requirements document. Yeah, exactly. Totally agree. Yeah. Oh, we've got one question come through. Sure. Um, would you see jazz as compatible with what you're teaching here? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. So improvisation uh, in this sense, I've taken from the dramatic arts, but we can associate improvisation with a number of different um, genres and jazz. Certainly, if you look at jazz, um, Again, from my knowledge of it, I'm not a jazz musician by any stretch, but there are, there is a discipline and it's not just chaos. There is certainly a discipline to repetition of chords and kind of the layers once you've got a, a, a basic rhythm 
that you can improvise around a rhythm or a set of chords. And that is, again, there is a, even watching jazz musicians work together, there is an ex obviously an extreme amount of listening there, that they're doing, but also there's a discipline to perhaps eye contact and timing that even that they are paying attention to, but perhaps more effort at listening, more with less effort than we would as non-musicians. Same with improvis improvisational actors. I said to Lee Simpson, who's one of the comedy store players and um, one of the more famous improv troops, and I said, "How do you? How do you? You must be exhausted when you come off stage." And he said, "Actually, it's not. You just kind of get the the muscles that you're using are being exercised that often that you don't." even you're just in the moment you don't even realize that you're doing and that's what we talked about you hear the words flow a lot you hear the words of finding that in the zone moment and i'm pretty sure jazz musicians have the same thing where they're so in tune with their other musicians on stage but they've got there through discipline and they've got there through some fairly simple um principles behind what they do but what you know with simple uh processes complex behaviors can emerge so that's a great, yeah, great observation. Uh, any other questions? And, and no questions, no other questions at the moment. Any questions for Paul? Nothing coming through. Should we have one final call before freeing you up? <laughs> <laughs> Give people a oh, here we go. How can I get my team more engaged? I try experimental. I I try experimental aspect and ask them to try and get engaged, not being productive. What can I do? Lately, nominating technique is working. Okay, so yeah, um, with that in the first chapter in my book, it very much talks around this idea of safety. So most team dysfunction, most team behaviours. And normally, you know, you can work it all the way back to some kind of fear of, of, of being vulnerable, fear of being judged, laughed at by, by other team members, feel that their job's on the line, whatever it might be. But there's a genuine fear is the primary driver in this. And even a lack of engagement is probably stems all the way back from teams not feeling safe. So as a facilitator, I perhaps go all the way back Try not to deal with and, and, and poking people to, to get involved you know, with direct questions. But for me, it might be more fundamental around has this team even formed yet? Has this team gone through that forming process? Because a lot of teams that I've coached don't give it a lot of time, don't give it, pay a lot of attention because they don't feel they have time to go back and, uh, to, and to reform and to actually sit down and build their relationships together. Again, there's some fairly nice, um, fairly easy techniques uh, and games you can pick up in my book as well, um, just to get people used to dealing with and feeling that um, we can trust each other. And if we can start to trust each other, we might be more prepared to add um, so, and contribute to meetings without feeling judged or um, or going to be laughed at, ridiculed by any member of our team. So yeah, it's, it's just, I think safety is, is, the, is where I'd start and trying to, trying to build some strong bonds between team members. You can do that as a team. You can do that on, on in smaller teams and groups, but you're trying to bring that that group together, that group dynamic um, together, and trying to get past that um, that invulnerability that Lenzi only talks about certainly. Perfect. Uh, we have a few more questions streaming in now, Paul. Um, okay. One one from Phil. Would you adapt your improvisation techniques or modules with people who you know or have worked out? Who have worked out? Sorry, with people who you know who have worked out the modules you're following and become disengaged or skeptical. Yeah, I think I would, um, and I'm very clear on that. I know that the improv. Um, if you walk into a room and say we're going to do some improv, most um, uh, software developers I know would run out of the room screaming, kicking, and screaming. So you've got to know your audience. I think that's your. Um, the first thing as a facilitator or as a leader, wh whichever role you have, but know who you're working with and know where to start as well. There's, there's, there's different ways you can approach it. Like I say, that safety element, 
generally some of the more advanced games that I've done, improv games that I've done with teams, tend to be teams that have a, a, a more increased level of maturity. So they've they've been around together a bit longer. They know each other a, li a little bit deeper and they're, they're more comfortable with each other. And once you can get past that fear of feeling, uh, as Keith Johnson said, says, mad, bad or stupid, once you can get past that, you can start to get into the realms of re real creativity and collaboration. And that's why teams are perhaps more prepared to play a little bit more together. I mean, you think about uh, the other example is like a f family gatherings, if anyone can remember when they when we were allowed to have family gatherings. Um, but the idea of actually getting together and playing a game at Christmas, wherever it might be, but that around the, 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 the table party games, you enjoy those because you don't worry about looking silly or you don't worry about being judged by because they're your, they're your close family. They're, they're people that, you know, whatever you say, they're not, they're not going to uh, hold it against you. So we want to try and create more of that that level of safety within teams. And then but, but knowing that for that, you know, if some games aren't for some people. That's absolutely fine. And um, I'm very much you know open to the fact that not all these games are going to shoot um, are going to be great fits for everyone in every team. So, so know your audience, I think, is the key message there. OK, great. Um, anonymous one for you, Paul. Uh, how do you measure improvement in a team? How do you measure improvement in a team? Um, good question. I suppose it's not really related to improv, but it's just generally um, well, there's easy ways and hard ways. There's easy metrics and hard metrics. Um, what I would say is that um, a lot of organisations that I know tend to focus on the easy metrics, but that the easy just because it's easy doesn't make it the best metric. So things like velocity or things like um, uh, business value or things like um, cycle time, they're easy to measure, but are they the best measure of teams improving? Some of the harder things to measure are things like morale things like uh, creativity, things like collaboration, because they perhaps take a bit longer to grow and they're much harder to qualify. So um, I think uh, some of the better teams have sat down with their management teams and tried to say, well, we've got certain, these certain metrics that you need, but we'd like to introduce some of these metrics that we think we need, that we think will judge our, uh, or help us improve. And the better agile teams I've seen have that kind of um, two way communication with their management team so they can see more of a rounded impression of not just raw um, return on investment or bottom line results. But you can have what you could end up with there is a, a great team delivering a lot of features very fast, but they're just miserable or they just they never create anything new and their morale is very low. So what you actually want is, is probably a, a blend of both sets of easy to measure metrics that management need, but also some softer, perhaps more longer term um, benefits and improvements that you'd hope a team is trying to willing to invest in because people want to enjoy their, their, their team environment as well. So probably a mix of both, I think. OK, great. Uh, just two more. Uh, one from Toby. If there are members of the team who block things, how do you handle that? Um, Good question, Toby. Um, if there's a member of the team that block things. So firstly, trying to understand why people might block. Now, blocking is, isn't is always a bad thing. I might have labelled it bad in that kind of uh, session there, but block blocking is actually quite useful. And sometimes a block can be ne is needed in order for us to allow um, us to see something. As long as we can Re rework that block and, and carry it if, as long as it's a relatively small percentage of the offers that we're having because it can be useful to reset. Um, improvisers also use another word, word called a tilt which isn't quite as as, uh, as negative as a block but it's more it kind of takes us in a different direction um, but blocks can be um, useful. The thing to perhaps to, to be aware of is if blocking is continuous or is blocking is starting to outweigh the offers in our environment. In that case, I might um, it might be more of a one to one discussion with that person to make make them aware of that or just to play back some of the language that they're using. 
and how and try and keep it quite observation in terms of when you say these things that you know that I tend to notice that the number of ideas that follow it actually drop and things like that so making people aware of of, of their um the language that they're using and the impact that it's having and just making requests being polite about it to say in the theory of non-violent communication I've seen that you uh, tend to have um, use a lot of this language and perhaps give some examples of that language. But could I ask that you try to use some positive, uh, try and counter that with a positive and perhaps put some protocols around even the, the way we respond to uh, suggestions as a team, making it more of a team agreement might be a useful way to, to look at it. But good question, but not all blocks. It's not, it's not about everyone always being positive because some blocks are useful but if the team can learn how to twist that block into something positive it can be a very useful way um, to, to collaborate. Good question Toby. Thanks Paul. Final question uh, yeah. again an anonymous one. Um, if you could choose one improvisation technique to improve communication skills what would it be? Um, one improvisation technique to use uh, to improve communication skills. I think so. It's, it's, a, it's a technique, I suppose, something I've, I've caught myself doing um, is literally playback. And I do, I particularly do this a lot when I'm coaching one to one, but um, it's a kind of a yes and thing. It is taken exactly from yes and. It's to prove that I've heard what you said. I am going to repeat it word for word. So it's a great way of me practicing my memory. It's a great way of me practicing that I, I was listening. So I'm, I'm working those muscles. I'm going to try and tune in to every single word that you said. And then I'm going to try and replay that, what that, those words that you use without putting any judgment, any spin on it at all. I heard you say these words. And sometimes just the act of playing words back can be enough to help someone else realize what they should do next without the fit without as a coach needing to feeling the need to answer the question or to tell them what to do give them a solution which is a very much a the rescuer in me it's actually just playing back what i'm hearing can be an offer in itself so that would probably be my um the, the te te technique that i've learned and i try to apply as a coach more often than not if i'm struggling just play back what they said and see where it takes you Great, thanks, Paul. Um, no problem. So thank you very much, Garrett, for, for hosting, and thank you to everyone for um, for turning up and and listening in. I hope it was useful, and enjoy the rest of your uh, your day. Yeah, thank you very much, Paul. Just like to echo that, and thanks for giving up your time today. Excellent session. Um, no problem. I'll speak to you soon. Thank you very much. Thanks for your time. Cheers. Bye bye.